Abdian, dear colleagues, dear guests, welcome back to our second panel of the Future Leaders Forum, part of the Riga Conference 2021. I'm delighted to introduce our, our panelists. We have Florian Hartlieb, who is from Hansa Advice and a lecturer at the Catholic University Eichstadt in Germany. We have Yonella Maria Siolem, who will be joining us online. Hello, Yonella. She's a research fellow at the European Policy Center. We have Jushana Feig, who is a PhD candidate at the European University in Viadrina, which is in Frankfurt Oda. And Jushana is also an associate researcher at the European Council of Foreign Relations. And last but certainly not least, we have Eric Pavel from the public diplomacy section of NATO. So we will start with Florian first, who will be giving us a very interesting lecture on terrorism. And before we start, I should say this is something that I believe we should really concentrate on is disruptions within member states and how this impacts uh, intergovernmental operations. So without further ado, Florian, the floor is yours, but I'll remind uh, our guests we are going to end 10 minutes prior because of an engagement. So Florian. Yeah, thank you very much, Louis. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here in Riga. And I'm talking about maybe a new phenomenon, um, the right-wing inspired lone wolf terrorist. But let me um, cite, sorry to say myself, uh, for my book, Lone Wolves, uh, published in Springer, because I think it would fit for us. A famous old Chinese proverb attributed to the war terrorist, um, Shun Tzu states, kill one, terrify 10,000. A modern terrorist would even say, in the global age, then after 9-11, kill one, terrify 10, or even 100 million. And also, we no longer need an organized group to generate this terror, more or less a DNA of terrorism. One lone individual suffices nowadays, as we maybe even know after the recent attacks yesterday in Norway, and what we also know, unfortunately, after the 22nd July 2011 with the Breivik attacks. Um, Breivik tweeted this time, one person with a belief is equal to the force of 100,000 with merely interests. Former US President Barack Obama demonstrated that he was downright far-sighted in this regard following Breivik's um, assaults. In August 2011, Obama stated that the threat of lone wolves, terrorist single actors, is greater than that of organized groups. So that's why I think um, we have to talk about this so-called myth of lone wolf terrorism, because the question is also, um, is this single actor at the end of the day, is, is he really have to say he, because it's more or less a male phenomenon, is he really acting alone or is he kind of a part of a network? As I said before, he's not a part of an analog network. Uh, in all of these cases, uh, which I'm uh, showing you, um, he's not um, part of a, a political party of an organization. So we have to rethink our approach towards terrorism. Uh, but the question is, uh, is he not a part of a virtual network? And uh, we can also basically observe kind of a virtual inspiration of these lone wolves or these single actors. So um, if you see, uh, if, you, uh, if, if you look at this uh, table, then it actually shows that we have um, attacks throughout the world. Um, the Breivik uh, uh, attacks, then on the same day, five years later, an attack in Munich, which was uh, three years and three months not regarded as uh, extremist attacks. It was regarded as unpolitical. Then the Christchurch attack um, with the Brenton Tarrant. And then uh, basically, uh, for example, El, El Paso uh, or uh, also Norway attack and uh, were uh, clearly um, uh, inspired from these Breivik attacks. And also this uh, case in Germany, Halle, when one person wanted to basically attack a Jewish synagogue, a uh, person who basically never was uh, also a member of a political party organization, he never was in his life in the social media. And this brings me to another point that uh, we have to rethink 
for the security, our approach that uh, we have to focus on the uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and so on. But um, basically, US security already stated a couple of years ago, we are talking about um, new image boards, new memes, new symbols such as A-Chain. And you can see that very clearly that we have this development even towards a kind of live stream, uh, live stream terrorist attack. So we have these attacks um, very clearly targeted. It's not just Amok, not just to a, a random group. So the, the basically the target is uh, uh, basically very clearly set out. Muslims, Jews, Mexicans, people with migration background. So it's clearly targeted. And all these kind of um, um, <clears throat> terrorists, they also have a manifest uh, in which they are basically are talking about um, the messages. So we have a new dimension of right-wing terrorism, maybe even a bigger threat than the Islamic terrorism. But for example, the German security is concerned about after the attacks in Germany, in Halle, in Hanau. And uh, generally, we have this virtualization, in, in international, internationalization of the right-wing terrorism. What we also saw, for example, in Estonia, uh, in which a 13 years old boy was the so-called com commander of a uh, Feuer Kriegs Divi division, which was basically kind of a twin group of the Atomwaffen division. Uh, so basically, we can see um, that even teenager can turn to be a terrorist in our virtual age, and also that uh, the security concerns affects also here the Baltic state. For example, the Christchurch terrorist also was traveling uh, to Estonia and to Latvia uh, just shortly before his attacks. This was a Munich attacker. Uh, the guy was basically uh, born in Munich. Um, originally, his parents were coming as um, refugees from Iran, and he basically hated other ethnic groups, and he wanted to uh, make uh, his uh, home city, Munich, free of immigrants. He planned these attacks uh, more than one year. Uh, he used a WhatsApp uh, a picture of uh, Breivik, and he killed nine people uh, with migration background uh, next to the Olympic Center in Munich. Yeah, important in this case concerning the virtualization and internationalization of the terrorism is uh, the symbols. So, for example, the moon man was a symbol for the, uh, for the Halle terrorist. This was a symbol from the McDonald's advertisement in the 80s. And also, basically, here you can see uh, very clearly the mutual inspiration. Brendan Tarrant uh, has inspired the later attacks in El Paso um, against Mexicans and also the Halle attacks. Uh, Another uh, important factor in this case aspect is the uh, gamification of terrorism. The Munich attacker was basically connected with a later attack in New Mexico. This is uh, the platform Steam, and this was the so-called anti-refugee club with 206, uh, uh, 261 people, members involved. And they also basically um, uh, uh, were responsible that this guy uh, from Munich was a hero afterwards in this kind of gaming language. So this new tendency is this gamification of terrorism. This were the chats of the, uh, here in A-chain of the uh, Christchurch terrorist with symbols, with memes, uh, with pictures. And this was the so-called Encyclopedia Dramatica, uh, similar to Wikipedia, in which the uh, Munich guy, for example, was regarded as a hero. And the hero number one was Breivik, clearly inspired uh, for other attacks until now. Recently in Germany, there were two other uh, attacks which were found just before, uh, um, who said that uh, this guy said that Breivik is idle. Uh, Tarrant was a role model for El Paso and for Halle. So this goes further and further, these new developments. And I think it's a big security uh, concern uh, in several regards um, because um, these guys, are not known before for the police. These are single attackers, and uh, that's why we need uh, a closer um, 
uh, cooperation, um, which actually um, was the goal or is still the goal of this so-called Christchurch call after the Christchurch attacks with Macron and others. So states have to cooperate further. Also on the EU level, there is this kind of uh, radicalization awareness network and also for the NATO, because uh, I think at the end of the day, this is a big security threat for the Western world. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. And indeed, as, as, as chilling as that is, you highlight something of fundamental importance that, that really highlights the need for uh, interagency cooperation across borders. And I commend you for doing research, uh, looking at documents and giving us a better understanding of how these people work and how they adapt to social media in light of, of clampdowns, um, which I'm sure we can talk about in the Q&A. But moving on to Yonella. Uh, Yonella, the floor is yours for climate security in the Arctic. Welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I'm very pleased and it's an honor for me to be here with you. Uh, so I will shortly address in my presentation about the climate security and especially the impacts on the Arctic region and what are the opportunities and challenges for NATO. Uh, for the past decades, uh, we already know and experienced the rapid decay of environment around the world from rising temperatures to melting glaciers years to extreme weather condition, floods or drought, the increasing uh, sea level or extinction of various animals, climate change is unstoppable and irreversible. And climate change has also lasting social uh, political consequences, economic repercussions and acts as a risk multiplier. While the phenomenon doesn't directly lead to conflict, its ramification fosters the probability of instability, insecurity, and uncertainty. And in this context, uh, I would like to uh, focus more on the Arctic uh, region and the climate security repercussions. Uh, once a hot spot between the United States and the Soviet Union, the Arctic region was an example of peaceful multilateral cooperation for the past three decades under the United Nations Arctic Council framework. Nevertheless, the climate change is transforming the Arctic into a geopolitical battleground. As the effects of climate change are developing three folds faster than anywhere on the globe, the combination of economic opportunities, legal challenges, institutional capacities, and military capabilities create a concussion of security challenges that are requiring a multidimensional political and military solution. Apart from providing the possibility for short transportation route and being rich in natural resources, we have here 13% of the world's undiscovered oil uh, reserves and 30% of world's um, gas reserves. The Arctic region is a strategic point from a military perspective. The ice surrounding the Arctic Ocean provide reduced acoustic, thermic, and electromagnetic signature, making the zone a perfect hub for the summer winds. Uh, so, in this regard, the Arctic region requires specific attention uh, because we are starting to see a security dilemma being developed in the Arctic. Both Russia and NATO member states are increasing their military presence and activities in the region and threat perception on both sides are intensifying. There are various frameworks for regional and sub-regional cooperation uh, among the Arctic countries, most notable the Arctic Council, but none of them address the military security issues. As such, and even more, after 2014, this uh, platform, and some of them had a small co uh, security component, such as the Arctic Security Forces Roundtable and the Arctic Chief of Defense Staff meeting, uh, have been suspended or held without Russian participation. So at this moment, there um, isn't any Arctic forum in which hard security issues could be discussed among uh, the member states, which also includes Russia. 
uh, in the past years, we saw that especially the European Arctic, um, it's currently mostly a military, uh, sim mostly military activity uh, as construction of new uh, military bases, airfields, naval facilities, radar and testing sites, and missile storage facilities. This increasing military activity in the Arctic continued to elevate the risk of misunderstanding or intentional escalation among the Arctic states. For example, for Russia, the past year have represented a return to a version of its Cold uh, War era posture centered along long-standing missions of protecting the sanctuary of its ballistic missile submarines uh, and operation in the uh, North Atlantic in the event of a war in Europe. So uh, these are creating a very dangerous context for um, um, the Arctic states. And from the Arctic states, it's important to mention that five of eight Arctic states are NATO member states. So we have um, United States, Canada, Iceland, Norway, and Denmark, apart from uh, uh, Russia, Sweden, and Finland. So uh, when it comes to NATO's approach to the Arctic, um, given the fact that the present politically and military tensions, the Arctic uh, represented a um, very delicate subject for the alliance. Um, and uh, until recently, NATO had a limited involvement in the Arctic uh, region due to the, uh, but due to the rising global competition and rivalry, the allies might in the future start to be more active in the region. And uh, we also see a shift in the US narrative regarding climate change with officials of Biden administration publicly declaring that uh, climate security is a national security. And the question arises, what's the role of NATO in climate security and what should be the role of um, NATO in the Arctic region? Um, the main challenges for NATO in the Arctic uh, are coming from two main actors, on one side Russia, on the other China, but let's start with Russia. For the past uh, decade, the Kremlin have adopted uh, and adapted uh, Russia's force posture and uh, revamping its military capability alongside the creation of a full-fledged military district in the Arctic in um, January 2021, so this year. Uh, the Arctic region is important for Russia, not only from a military point of view, but also because it represents a transit, um, commercial transit, transport transit, uh, to move goods from uh, Europe to Asia. Um, and also it's a place of resource exploitation uh, of natural resources that can also sustain Russia's foreign policy ambition from an economical point of view. Um, so we see that uh, all these uh, factors have created a uh, a uh, Kremlin's manifestation and announcement of increasing its uh, capabilities in the Northern Flea, uh, the one which is based on the Arctic region, um, to be uh, upgraded in order to phase NATO out of the Arctic. So in the past couple of years, uh, the Northern Flea capabilities have been modernized with the introduction of more capable uh, naval surface combats, um, missile and artillery units for new big brigades combat teams, a monitorized infantry brigade and more sophisticated air defense system. All of them has the uh, purpose of increasing its defense uh, of the territory and seas surrounding the Kola Peninsula and denial access of this region to United States or NATO forces. Uh, the other main uh, challengers of NATO in the region is uh, China. China is not an Arctic Sea, uh, but uh, in the past couple of years, he has declared itself as a near Arctic state, a concept that um, basically it defies meaning. Uh, 
Uh, nevertheless, this self-designation uh, reflects uh, Beijing's significant interest in the uh, Arctic, including its aspiration to create a polar silk road for commerce through the Arctic as an extension to the, its Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, so, in service of its uh, Arctic ambition, China has conducted regional scientific exploration in the region, established research facilities in the high north, and it's developing a constellation of 24 polar observatory satellites. As such, we are asking ourselves which are the opportunities for NATO. As the new recent uh, NATO 2030 reports uh, calls for a more increased situational awareness towards the high north and the Arctic, and also uh, the creation of a proper Arctic strategy. But we have to keep in mind that NATO is not the ideal place to discuss military security affairs in the Arctic, uh, because NATO has to balance between different Arctic interests. For example, inside the member states, there are countries who uh, reject the role of NATO in the region, for example, Canada, while others are supporting it for example, Norway. So what NATO can do, NATO can engage more in diplomacy and deterrence activities. In diplomacy, NATO can try to work more with Russia and seek um, um, cooperation on areas of common interest, um, as well as uh, devise rules of uh, the road similar to those that existed previously uh, during the Cold War to reduce the tensions, avoid or manage crises and mitigate the risk of conflicts in the region. Uh, deterrence, the United States and also NATO should continue to improve their defenses to discourage Russia from harassing their military or commercial aircraft and ships in I'm, and around the Arctic. Sorry. So, and the last point is sorry. that is in, the last point is that inside the alliance, the opportunity of dialogue and cooperation among member states to decide together a common path and integrate more the climate security risk in the actions, strategies, and policies of NATO. So these are the main, basically, three recommendations that I can have on this term. And sorry for the delay. No, I apologize, Yonello. I really do not like cutting speakers off. Thank you for a very enlightening presentation. I wish we had more time to discuss, well, everything, but uh, climate security is indeed another very important challenge that I think raises a lot of more questions uh, than it does answers. So thank you for that. Uh, we'll move right along to Shushana Veg, who will talk about domestic challenges within member states. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, so yes, I will be talking about uh, domestic challenges uh, in the Alliance. And uh, with that, I would like to highlight that uh, with this, we are talking about a little bit of a different type of threat to NATO, to uh, the international community. Because uh, normally, uh, or how it started, we were talking about external threats. Uh, then when we are discussing terrorism or when we are discussing um, climate change, we are still talking about threats that we can uh, clearly delineate uh, ourselves from. Uh, those are still uh, others. They, they are still not part of our in-group. But what I would like to talk about now is uh, challenges that are posed by the very in-group uh, challenges posed by, if you would like to put it that way, by us. Um, this goes back to the question of uh, resilience. This goes back to the question of identity uh, of the whole alliance that uh, Maria was also touching upon in the previous panel. Um, before I go further, I also need to highlight that uh, my views do not represent uh, any of my organizations. And since you will see that I am going to be somewhat more critical of the Hungarian government here, I also want to highlight that my views do not represent of the views of any uh, Hungarian American billionaire either, uh, just to... Uh, run ahead of potential criticism here. 
Uh, so if you read the panel description, <coughs> Luis was talking there about uh, authoritarian populism. Uh, I would like to uh, use a different concept in my presentation. I will be referring to the radical right uh, or the populist radical right. Uh, what do I mean by that? I mean uh, primarily parties, political actors, which are authoritarian and uh, nativist, and they pose a challenge uh, to democracy as such. So we are here at a security conference. Uh, why is it nonetheless relevant to talk about this? First of all, I would say that uh, the radical rise uh, radical right is a rising uh, phenomenon. It is gaining increasing representation uh, across the alliance. Um, and what's more, it is having a sustained presence also in elected and executive office. And not only executive office as junior partner, but by now, Today, we see also radical right parties maintaining representation in uh, executive as senior partners or simply as senior parties uh, in government. Uh, where do we see such trends? Um, of course, when it comes to populist uh, authoritarianism that we also see in Turkey. Uh, we also see uh, radical right rising, populist uh, authoritarianism in the United States. We have seen uh, the Trump presidency, uh, but what I will be focusing on here is the region of Central and Eastern Europe where we see uh, radical right parties uh, being in government for uh, multiple political cycles. Um, how is it relevant to NATO? And I was saying that they pose a threat to democracy, which I will elaborate on. Um, NATO is a military organization. Why is it relevant here? Uh, well, if we think back uh, to the 90s, the 95 uh, study on the enlargement of NATO highlighted uh, that NATO is also a community of uh, democracies. And in fact, it highlighted that uh, new members have to meet three prerequisites before being able to join. They have to be democracies, they have to respect individual rights, and they also have to uphold the rule of law. This uh, is the DNA of NATO as well. Uh, this identifies what NATO is and who NATO members are. So this is a question of identity. This is an ontological question in itself. Why is it important? Because by adhering to these same rules and principles, those who are part of the club uh, at, um, commit to uh, playing the same game, following the same rules of the game. Uh, this creates trust between uh, the members. And this goes back again to uh, what Maria was saying. These values and principles are the glue that holds this community together. So if we look at the 90s, it's clear that the expectation was that after the end of the Cold War, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, the new members who will join NATO will be democracies. At this point, uh, there was a clear perception that transition away from authoritarian states is going to lead to democratization, to democratic consolidation. What we see now shows that this was clearly not a one-way street, and democratization is not a straightforward process either. And then we haven't even talked about consolidation of uh, democracies. Instead, uh, what we have observed over the past few decades, and especially uh, over the past, I would say, 15 years, is that even within the European Union, especially among uh, new member states, which are not that new by now, uh, we see new forms of democratic erosion. These new forms uh, of democratic erosion, here referring to Nancy Bermeo, uh, follow a different process 
than what we have seen before. These are no longer uh, straightforward regime breakdowns, not coups, but what we see is usually democratically elected officials dismantling the very foundations and institutions of democracies that got them to position in the first place. Vermeer refers to it as uh, executive aggrandizement. Um, so what happens in this process? In this process, from the rule of law, through the rule of lawyers, we are moving towards a situation where what we end up with is essentially the law of the ruler. Um, in this process, uh, the authoritarian uh, parties which uh, hold executive position also, of course, try to secure their office, which very often does not only uh, go together with the dismantling of checks and balances, but with an increase in corruption, which in itself is a security risk, it's a security threat, and it's also a threat to democratic security. Um, we have seen this process and it has uh, shown extreme examples in the case of Hungary and increasingly so in Poland as well. Uh, the old front runners of democratization uh, among the new member states. Uh, we can measure democratic quality in a variety of different ways, but if we just take uh, the Nations in Transit Index from Freedom House, we see that uh, what we ended up with is not only uh, the deconsolidation of democracy and the erosion of democratic quality, but essentially uh, a change in regimes. In Hungary, uh, for two years now, we uh, have observed the regime shifting into a hybrid regime instead of a democratic or semi-consolidated democratic regime. Um, with this, uh, radical right parties, which have undertaken this process, uh, by today moved into a position where they no longer only impact parties, other parties' positions and certain policies, but the very quality of polities. And I will make the argument this is not only relevant on the national level, but by undermining the democratic quality of their own polity, they also impact uh, the cooperation within those alliances where they are members and where they belong. So from parties to policies to polities, we have uh, observed an impact also on the international community level. How does it materialize? First of all, it undermines um, that very glue uh, that holds the community together. If we see values and principles disappearing uh, from governance practices on the domestic level, how can we expect that to still be a driving force on the international scene? Uh, partners can no longer uh, expect that. Um, when values and principles are silent uh, in international foreign policy decisions as well, then uh, what speaks louder is money. And here I mentioned uh, that authoritarianization uh, or autocratization very often goes together with corruption and uh, it exposes uh, security risks within the community. Here, when we are talking about Central and Eastern Europe, it's important to underline that we are still talking about countries which are both poor in capital and in resources. To uphold power, uh, the parties in position are reliant on external resources. Until now, it has been resources from the European Union, but when the European Union started to raise criticisms, uh, in the case of Hungary at least, we have seen a turn towards China and Russia. Hungary stands as the prime example of uh, undermining also joint foreign policy uh, positions and uh, acting as a Trojan horse within the community. It appears, of course, already on the EU level, but I would say it's also relevant for NATO. Um, but in this context, what is the good news? We see radical right parties rising, we see radical right parties in executive office, uh, 
the good news is that they are not united when it comes to international questions, when it comes to foreign policy. The bad news, however, is that they don't need to be. Uh, the bad news is that both uh, Russia and China are perfectly happy with only influencing one or the other and thus undermining uh, the unity of uh, the alliance, the European community, uh, and such create weak links who are themselves maybe willing uh, to uh, follow different interests than the community itself. Um, so. I will leave it at that. Uh, of course, it leaves open uh, the million dollar question, what can we do about it? Uh, but maybe one of you will ask that, and then I can continue with that. OK, uh, thank you, Jujana. And um, uh, before we open the floor to a QA, and a I will pass the, uh, the floor to Eric Pavel, who will give us some concluding remarks as to this panel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Louis, and uh, thanks for Lato to invite me here to come to the Riga Conference Future Leaders for months again. Um, and hopefully also to the Riga Conference in the next few days. Interesting discussions forward. So what I will do um, very briefly, um, as the, the title of this panel is Challenges <coughs> Facing the Alliance. Um, as you heard, I'm an official NATO official, so I cannot give my f totally free my own opinion. I'm representing, of course, the institution here. So what I would like to do is look back a little bit at the summit we had in June this year, where we took major decisions on the NATO 2030 agenda, which is a very broad agenda, um, and also looking forward to our next summit next year, where we're hopefully also going to, to agree on a new strategic concept, which is, as you may know, sort of our new policy. It's our policy bi Bible, as I like to call it, it's one of the most important policy documents that, that we have in NATO. That's also then an, an agreed document by all 30 allies. Um, so a bit the, the summit scene setter as we had it for the, the, the Brussels summit in June last, uh, last June. Um, we are faced with a world which is not only getting smaller, it's also getting more competitive. And there are indeed growing challenges to our security already mentioned, authoritarian regimes like in Russia and China are challenging our rules-based international order. And we face very complex threats, including terrorism, already mentioned, but also sophisticated cyber attacks and the misuse of disruptive technologies, as we call it. And of course, a very big elephant in the room nowadays, climate change. All of these challenges are far greater than any country or continent can tackle alone. But the value of the NATO alliance is that we are not alone. We are 30 nations across Europe and North America, representing half of the world's economic might and over half of the world's military might. That's precisely what we're doing, working together, and what the summit in Brussels last June was all about. So let me go through some of the key summit decisions as the leaders agreed a very ambitious and substantial agenda through what we call the NATO 2030, uh, NATO 2030 initiative. Firstly, we decided to enhance our unity and cohesion. This means we're going to use NATO even more as the unique and indispensable forum for Europe and North America to ensure our shared security deciding and acting together. It also means we're going to reinforce our military posture by making sure our forces are ready to defend any ally at any time against any threat. We need the best militaries with the right equipment. So as we look to 2030, we will continue to invest in our armed forces and modern military capabilities. They have kept us safe for over 70 years. And security is the foundation for our prosperity. We need a safe and stable environment for our societies and our businesses to thrive. Secondly, strong militaries are important. You would expect that from a NATO official to say. But strong societies are our first line of defense. So we must raise the level of ambition when it comes to resilience. And that is why another decision we took is to work together with all our allies to set more measurable national goals 
to increase our resilience. This way we can better protect our critical infrastructure and supply chains. We can make our societies less vulnerable to attack and coercion and ensure our militaries can operate at all times. Thirdly, we also decided to sharpen our technological edge. NATO's ability to innovate is what has guaranteed our military superiority, including our technological edge for the past seven decades. We are now competing with authoritarian regimes that misuse and abuse new technologies to destabilize us and to manipulate and disrupt our free and democratic way of life. We have seen this trend accelerate during the pandemic. We cannot let this happen. We must remain competitive in a more contested and competitive space. For this reason, the Allies agreed to launch what we call a Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, or with a nice acronym, DIANA. So you will never forget it. We will work with startups, industry and universities to promote transatlantic cooperation on new technologies. We also agreed to establish an opt-in NATO Innovation Fund to invest in startups working on emerging and disruptive technologies. Fourthly, one of the great challenges, as I mentioned, of today is climate change. It is making the world more dangerous. It has a serious, serious impact on our security, so climate change matters to NATO. We have recognized climate change as a security challenge for many years, but now we are stepping up our efforts through NATO 2030. At the last summit, NATO leaders approved an ambitious action plan. We agreed to set the gold standard on addressing the security implications of climate change and made a clear commitment to significantly reduce military emissions. And finally, the last point I want to mention is about our values of democracy, it was already mentioned, freedom, justice and human rights. They are under pressure like never before. Countries like Russia and China are at the forefront of an authoritarian pushback against the rules-based international order and NATO will continue to play its part to uphold a system that has served us so well for many decades. It is not something we can do alone. It is a collective effort. That is why we also agreed to deepen our existing partnerships and forge new ones with like-minded countries and organizations around the world. We all need to speak with one voice to defend our values and interests and encourage others to play by the rules. Finally, all the decisions we took at the summit must be underpinned by the right resources through national defense expenditure and NATO common funding. To do more together, we need to invest more together in NATO. For instance, to support more joint training and exercises, build stronger cyber defenses and better infrastructure, and develop more capacity building for our partners. Looking at, we are going to develop NATO's next strategic concept in time for our Madrid summit in June next year. This is a crucial document that outlines and is an agreed assessment of the security environment of today and tomorrow, and then outlines following from that NATO's purpose and security tasks. The last strategic concept dates back to 2010, and our security environment obviously has drastically changed over the past decades. So we will develop a new one to reaffirm, reaffirm our values and reflect these changes. And we're confident that we will get an agreed document out by June uh, at the Madrid summit. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Short enough, huh? <laughs> yes. So now that we are unfortunately having to end 10 minutes early due to a slight schedule shift, I would like to open up the floor for a Q&A. Yes, uh, we have Andras in the back. Maybe two others can ask a question. Anyone else? Uh, thank you. Uh, a short question to Florian about the Lone Wolf terrorists. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that there is a clear ideological inspiration. I mean, they are inspiring one another. Is there any trace of operational coordination or learning from each other in the operational tactical sense? Thank you. 
Maybe we could select two more questions before Florian addresses Andres's question. Any anyone in the audience have questions? Uh, Roberta. Uh, Roberta in the front. Is going to Hi, I, my name is Roberta Haar, and I'm from Maastricht University. I'm a professor there. No, I was really happy this morning that we that China came up uh, at different times. But I had a question about specifically what will NATO do, and maybe also thinking about it, this new strategic concept. Will it include the Indo-Pacific as a part of that strategic concept? So I'm curious about what you think about that. And then I also, uh, when you talk about this resilience, was very much featured this morning as well. And the part of the resilience was the where. And I don't think we really went in through that the speaker didn't really go in too much about where the resilience would be. And I specifically want to know the where with regard to China. And even more specifically, what does NATO do when China is more aggressive to, to Taiwan than it is now, or even invades Taiwan? I want to know, does NATO have a role in Taiwan? Does anyone care to answer that? <laughs> Uh, Michael will be our third uh, uh, in the front. We have one third qu question. Uh, Michael Richter would like to ask. Yes, thank you very much. It will be a rather short question. I'm Michael here from the Research Center for East European Studies at the University of Bremen and from the SWP in Brussels. So my question would refer a bit to this idea of NATO as a community of values, especially in terms of democracy. And I'm wondering, of course, it has to be said that uh, NATO has officially uh, this uh, label of being <coughs> a, a, let's say, an alliance of democratic states, upholding those values. But my question may be a bit provocative, but how does it actually reflect in reality? And can we actually uphold this idea of being a democratic, let's say, an alliance, or an alliance that uh, pushes this idea of defending, promoting democracy forward? I'm not only referring to this, these internal uh, struggles, which were outlined before, but I'm also referring to uh, countries who would really like to join our uh, community, uh, countries like Georgia or Ukraine, and in the, in the case of Georgia, for instance, uh, this country, well, it, it made the strict pivot to the European Union towards the, uh, let's say, Western transatlantic community, and still we say, okay, the doors are de facto closed, right? This is what we say, basically. I mean, we might put it in other words, we say of a long-term perspective at some point in the future, but they basically meet this criteria better than many member states, right? So how actually how credible are we in those official let's say statements when we refer to this community of democratic uh, countries and uh, this community of defending democracy okay uh speakers shall i take the first one from roberta sure. on yeah. the, so you asked about resilience well of course the, the, uh, <clears throat> This is, of course, a sensitive topic also amongst allies because it's very much a national responsibility. You know, the strength of your society. Make sure that all your contingency plans are in place. That you know, if your government has a major crisis, that the government still works. I mean, you, you, the government has to do exercises. You know, in NATO we have an annual crisis management exercise. Uh, but it's very much focused on the foreign ministry and the defense ministries and the NATO apparatus. Uh, but I think now we have realized we also probably have to involve other ministries like the interior ministry, maybe even the finance ministry, maybe the, the health ministry, if it's a pandemic with, with security implications. So it, it may be a much broader uh, approach. And also what we try to do now under the, under, under the header of resilience is uh, asking nations to set up a certain minimal standard that they have to meet in order to be able to say, you know, at least the government is resilient enough to, to stand through, let's say, an initial first crisis uh, when faced. Uh, so we're trying now through the NATO framework to force the allies to come with a more structured plan, to be better prepared. Maybe some nations are, are, are very much, much more mature with that than others so but we now realize that um, you know just military security is not enough you you have to have a very broad understanding of security and so we are now trying through through the, the new resilience uh push 
to, to get nations to do better in doing their own, their own national homework first uh, and to be sure that also on a national level they're better prepared for any crisis. Uh, and I know there is, there's a lot of, well, at least there are some academics discussions starting now, reflections on what should be a strategic concept. You know, we have the last strategic concept from 2010 still has three main core tasks for NATO, collective defense, crisis management, corporate security. There are now some academics, I think particularly in the US, who say maybe resilience should be the fourth core task. If you still want to keep the three, they're still relevant, they're still, you know, it makes sense to keep them, but maybe add resilience as a fourth core task for NATO because it's so important, because that's where your national defense starts, basically. Um, on China, the Indo-Pacific, will it be a strategic concept? I have no crystal ball, but listening to the discussions we've had in, at many ministerials at the last summit, I would be highly surprised if it was not featuring, featured in a strategic concept. Um, uh, in the previous one, it was hardly mentioned. I think the first time we really mentioned China in a substantial way was it, at the summit in 2019 in, in London, and when it, where, where it appeared in, in, the, in the final communique, but very short. Uh, but since then, I think our awareness has grown of the, the challenge that China poses to our societies. Uh, it's not only an opportunity, but it's also a challenge, and it's also a security challenge. And I think that will be reflected no doubt, and, and the whole role of the Indo-Pacific will be reflected in the, in the strategic concept. How? Then I don't know. That's what the nations will have to start negotiating as of early next year. And your question, will we defend Taiwan? Of course, under the current uh, treaty, we only have the responsibility to defend NATO member states. Um, uh, and in a, in a limited geographic area. So uh, under, under the treaty, we have no obligation to defend Taiwan. What will happen if, if it's being attacked? Because nobody knows, then we have a new political dynamic and it will up to be to the political leaders of that moment to decide how and what we're, they're going to do to, uh, to defend Taiwan, whether it be a coalition of the willing. If, if anything, will, will the US defend Taiwan? That's also, I think, a relevant discussion within the US itself. Um, because there is, there, is, there is no treaty obligation, I understand, that the, the U.S. has towards Taiwan, so we will be in, in totally new political waters if that happens. Um, and my, my last point on the, on the values um, and the sort of the internal struggle uh, the only thing I can say is, well, uh, and I think also the, the experts report that was out, was it end of last year, as part of the NATO 2030 uh, process, uh, the, had a group chaired by Wes Mitchell and uh, Thomas de Mazier. I think they, they came up with a lot of suggestions and recommendations that the nations now can chew on. I think one of the recommendations was something in, in, the, in the direction of maybe we should build a mechanism into, the, into NATO in the North Atlantic Council to also sort of assess nations' democratic credentials. Um, I mean, and comparing to the EU, which also has its own problems with particularly Poland and Hungary, and, and going into legal proceedings and all the things, of course, in NATO, we don't have that. And NATO is, is, is of course, also quite a different animal than the EU is, um, where NATO is not, there's no supranationality. We are purely intergovernmental, where the nations run the organization. They are our bosses. So to expect the nations to assess each other or themselves for their democratic credentials, I think it's highly doubtful that there will, something will come out of that discussion that we will build in, into the NATO framework, a sort of a, 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 a democracy test. I think it's highly unlikely that we will want to be judging ourselves or, or each other. But that's, again, my speculation. I see uh, Iverson has, has a question. Yeah, hello. Um, Iverson, uh, Estonian columnist, uh, post-MS. 
So my question is addressed to uh, Susanna. You talk about the case of uh, Hungary. So I would like to know more about uh, the trajectory of uh, Hungary as a Chinese uh, Trojan horse. Uh, we have seen example about uh, European uh, Council resolution on Hong Kong being blocked by Hungary. Then we also see there is this uh, internal pushback from the city of Budapest that there were uh, tens of thousands of uh, students and other citizens, they uh, were going against the, uh, the building of the uh, Fudan University, which is like famous for the Chinese spies. Um, and obviously, uh, Victor Orban right now is quite pro-China, but then we have this internal opposition in the state of Budapest. So I would like to know about your assessment about um, how uh, Hungary is going to go in the future. Is this kind of internal pushback, you know, to, to be back to the liberal check will be uh, neutralized by Viktor Orban, or do you think Hungary will, will go further authoritarian? So uh, this is my question. Thank you. Uh, I think Florian got also a question from Andres before. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's right. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, concerning your question, um, professionalization, yes. Uh, Mutual inspiration, yes, um, because um, you can see that, for example, in the self-interviews of the actors. So in the first sentence of the manifesto of the El Paso attacker, he's referring um, to the Christchurch attacks. And also the Christchurch attacker is even asking himself, am I a lone wolf? What is my ideology? So basically you see kind of a, a reflection process even. And generally, to understand this phenomenon, it's a kind of a mixture between personal frustration and political radicalization. And um, what is obvious is that, of course, these are children uh, of our times. So you see some kind of uh, different ideologies like um, um, the identitarian um, which was uh, the symbol of the Christchurch attack. Uh, uh, you see the white uh, supremacy uh, ideas, um, which are sparing around. You, say, you, you also see a woman hate, some kind of inf influence from the, from the Einzel movement. You see some QAnon ideas, which uh, this conspiracy theory, which, which were coming under, under the Trump administration. And uh, it's, it's very uh, like a complex uh, phenomenon. But, uh, uh, these, these guys are PR strategists in their own uh, hands, so basically the last um, development was even to go to a kind of live stream attacks like we saw in the, in the Christchurch. And um, they all have manifest in even these uh, self-interviews. And um, uh, the other thing is the interesting underestimated uh, aspect out of that is uh, this kind of online subculture dealing with memes, uh, symbols. So for example, if you see the, the manifest of the Halle attacker, then he's actually uh, speaking about, hey, my name is uh, Enner and the, the Holocaust is not existing. Uh, the other thing is basically that he's, uh, he has in his manifest the so-called techno-barbarian girls. So uh, he's also describing himself as a moon man, even with a symbol here. So it's a very, very like, complex phenomenon. And it's, it's a mixture between personal frustration, political radicalization, and also this kind of gamification of terrorism. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, the question about the trajectory of, uh, of Hungary, I think. Uh, your assessment is fairly right that the current Hungarian uh, government is uh, fairly pro-China, uh, very uncritically. Uh, it is trying to avoid any sort of uh, human rights issue or even security questions related to China to enter the uh, EU agenda. Can I just say, uh, uh, ask you, what, what, uh, I mean, this is also kind of a business model, right? I mean, this. This Fudan University in Budapest is a double high budget uh, as a whole uh, higher education, right? I mean, I mean, the Orban did some, some business deals. So do you think it's some kind of business approach? As he said in this 2014 speech, the times of the, of the West is over. We have to go for the illiberal democracies. We have to orientate to Singapore, China, and so on. Or? Uh, 
Okay. Uh, well, whether there is business in this particular uh, situation with food and uh, it would be really hard to say anything with certainty because we don't know anything for certain. So okay. no documentation has been made public at all mm -hmm. uh, about this investment, similarly to another <clears throat> investment uh, about the railway connection between Belgrade and Budapest, which should also be built from uh, a huge Chinese uh, loan. Uh, so there is no transparency. Uh, at the same time, uh, business is there as part of uh, this new direction of Hungary's foreign policy, the whole Eastern opening, uh, where um, Hungary is trying to attract uh, funds from sources other than the West, other than the EU, also because here there are no strings attached, at least not strings of democracy uh, and democratic requirements. Uh, also, there is a, an intention to, to gain new markets, uh, but Hungarian uh, companies uh, are not necessarily competitive enough to enter these markets. Uh, so yes, in, in that regard, it is part of uh, a business model to open towards China uh, as well. Um, in the case of Fudan, as I said, uh, we do not see uh, what is part of the deal uh, and um, how exactly this would look like. There is indeed uh, an internal opposition to that. Um, which direction uh, Hungary would take? Uh, we have elections coming up next spring and at this point I would say it can go either way. And when I'm saying it can go either way, I'm actually moving away from a position which I held before that Fidesz is going to win again. So I think uh, at the moment, uh, unlike before, <clears throat> there is an opening for the democratic opposition uh, to at least come close, but potentially maybe even uh, win in the upcoming elections. The political camps uh, in the citizenry who are decided on their party preferences are relatively equal. At the same time, we have up to about 20% of the voters who are undecided or apathetic, not mobilized and so on. And it's gonna be uh, a matter of who can mobilize these people that will shift uh, the balance. At the same time, uh, it's also important to know that over the past decade, the uh, incumbent government has completely reshaped the constitutional order of the country. It uh, dismantled checks and balances. Uh, it put in place uh, Fidesz cronies or maybe even former Fidesz politicians uh, in institutions that should be checking power like the constitutional court, like the prosecutor's office, like the highest court and so on. Um, so whoever wins in the next elections, if the opposition manages to win in the next election, it will find itself in a situation where its uh, freedom of maneuver is really restricted. And it's an open question uh, in that situation how an opposition which will be if it wins a coalition uh, of six parties, most likely, will be actually able to govern. And I would say that when it comes to uh, governance, internal issues will take precedent over foreign policy. Uh, an opposition government would try to make sure that it settles uh, its relations with the European Union. First and foremost, it will probably uh, back out to the extent possible with deals made with China, maybe with Russia, but we don't know what's in those deals uh, and what kind of uh, commitments uh, the current government made for uh, the country as such. So um, back to the original question, at the moment, my assessment is really that it can go either way and this is a change compared to what I would have said before. 
Okay, well, due to a uh, scheduling change that uh, happened today because of our uh, guest speaker not being able to zoom in, uh, we have to end the panel slightly early, and we have to say to our dear speakers that we will present you with gifts at our dinner. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists. These are were exceptional presentations highlighting very diverse and important issues that NATO faces, as does uh, the EU. Um, Round of applause to everybody once more.